The Story of Peter Pan Part 1 Early Days In one of the nicest nurseries in the world, there were beds for three young people called John Napoleon and Wendy Moira Angela and Michael, the children of Mr. and Mrs. Darling. The nursery was wide and airy with the large window and a bright fire with the high fire guard around it and a big clock and prettily colored nursery rhyme pictures over the walls. On the evening on which our story begins, Nana was dozing peacefully by the fireside with her head between her paws. Mr. and Mrs. Darling were getting ready to go out to dinner and Nana was to be left in sole charge of the children. Presently, the clock went off with a whir and struck one, two, three, four, five, six. Time to begin to put the children to bed. Nana got up and stretched herself and carefully switched on the electric light. You would have been surprised to see how cleverly she managed to do that with her mouth. Then she turned the bedclothes neatly down and hung the little pajamas over the fire guard. She then trotted up to the bathroom and turned on the water. After filling it with her paw to make sure that it was not too hot, she went off to look for Michael, who, being the youngest of the three children, must go to bed first. She returned immediately with him sitting astride on her back as though she were a pony. Michael, of course, did not want to be bathed, but Nana was firm and, taking him to the bathroom, shut the door so that he should not be in a draft. Then Mrs. Darling came to peep at him as he splashed about in the nice warm water. Whilst Mrs. Darling was in the nursery, she heard a wee noise outside the window as a tiny figure, no bigger than a little boy, tried the window latch and vanished suddenly at her cry of surprise. She flung the window open, but there was nothing to be seen, nothing but the dim roofs of the neighboring houses and the deep blue sky above. She began to frighten herself with eerie bogey tales, for the same thing had happened the day before when Nana had gone to the window and shut it down so quickly that she had cut off the boy's shadow. Mrs. Darling had found it in Nana's mouth and had carefully folded it and put it away. But she soon felt reassured when her children came in together in answer to her call. John, Napoleon, and Wendy were playing at their favorite game of being father and mother, and Mrs. Darling's beautiful face beamed with delight as she listened to them. Suddenly, in rushed Mr. Darling, very much excited because he could not fasten his evening tie. Evening ties are difficult things to fasten, you know. Mrs. Darling easily managed that for him, and he was soon skipping about the room with Michael on his back, dropping it finally into his bed with a big bumper. Unfortunately, in going to the bathroom, Nana accidentally brushed against Mr. Darling's beautifully pressed black trousers and left some of her gray clinging hairs upon them. Now, no grown-up person likes hairy trousers, so Mr. Darling was very cross with Nana and spoke of dismissing her. But Mrs. Darling told him about the weird apparition at the window, how Nana had barked at it and shut the window down so fast that its shadow had been cut clean off and left behind. She showed him the shadow and told him how glad she was to have such a treasure as Nana for a nurse. You see how very useful Nana is, concluded Mrs. Darling, as a faithful dog came in with Michael's bottle of cough mixture. But Michael was naughty and would not take it. There was a fine fuss over it when Wendy, being a clever little girl, hit on a brilliant idea. Father should take some of his medicine to keep Michael company. Very well, said Mr. Darling. We shall see who is the braver. Two glasses were fetched and filled in a moment. One, two, three, cried Wendy. Michael took his like a man, but Mr. Darling only pretended to, and quietly hid the glass behind his back. John caught him in the act. Father hasn't taken his, he cried, and Michael, seeing that he had been tricked, burst into a loud boo-hoo. Mr. Darling, to appease Michael, thought of what seemed to him an excellent joke. 
He poured his medicine into Nana's drinking bowl, and when poor Nana, thinking that it was something nice, ran eagerly to lap it up, he roared with laughter to see the reproachful eyes she turned upon him. The children, who loved their old nurse very dearly, were terribly distressed as she slunk to her kennel, looking as woeful as hurt in her feelings as ever a dog did. Mr. Darling, angry that they did not enjoy his joke in the list, coaxed Nana out of her kennel, seized her by the collar, and dragged her off in disgrace to be chained up in the yard. The proper place for dogs, he said, in spite of the persuasions and pleadings of them all. Mrs. Darling comforted the children, kissing them very tenderly as mothers always do, tucked them up in their beds, sang them to sleep, and leaving the night lights burning for company, crept softly out of the room to go to the dinner party with Mr. Darling. Everything in the big nursery was now still and quiet. Suddenly, the night lights flickered, waned, and went out one by one, and there darted into the room a tiny ball of fire, which flitted uneasily about and finally vanished into a jug. Then, the same slender, graceful figure that had so started Mrs. Darling leapt from the darkness outside the window. There was just one click, the window was open, and the little creature stepped cautiously in. He seemed to be looking for something, and you will easily guess that what he was looking for was his shadow. Tink, where are you? he whispered, and as then the light shone on the jug he went on. Tink, do you know where they put it? Now, this little ball of light was really a fairy girl who knew everything worth knowing. Most fairies do. All you could see of her was the little flame, but you could hear her distinctly. She made a tinkling noise like a little silver bell, and that was why she was called Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell at last rested a few moments on the second drawer of the nursery dresser. Instantly, the boy ran joyfully to it, and pulling open the drawer, snatched out his shadow and neatly roared up, just as Mrs. Darling had left it. He had found it certainly, but the next trouble was to put it on again. A happy thought struck him. He would stick it on with soap. Sitting on the hearthrug, he soaped his feet, and then he soaped his shadow, but whichever way he soaped, they would not stick together. There is no use in having a shadow if it will not stick to you. After trying and trying in vain, the poor little fellow gave up the attempt, buried his face in his hands, and sobbed despairingly. It was then that Wendy awoke. She sat right up in bed and, not at all frightened, said, Little boy, why are you crying? The elfin creature sprang to his feet and, taking off his cap, bowed very politely. Wendy cursed in return, though she found it a difficult thing to do in bed. What's your name? asked the little boy. Wendy Mora Angela Darling. What's yours? Peter Pan. Where do you live? Second turning to the right and straight until morning. This seemed to Wendy a very funny address, but she was all sympathy when she heard that Peter had no mother. No wonder he was crying. But that was not the reason for Peter's tears. He was crying because he could not get his shadow to stick on. This made Wendy smile, and she emphatically declared that soap was no good. It must be sewn on. Shall I do it for you? she suggested, and jumping out of bed to get her work basket, she set to work at once. It hurts a good deal to have a shadow sewn onto your feet, but Peter bore it bravely. It was the right thing to do, for the shadow held on beautifully, and Peter was so delighted that he danced up and down the nursery, watching it making patterns on the floor as he flung his arms and legs about. Oh, the cleverness of me, cried Peter, overcome with joy, and he crowed with pleasure for all the world just as a cock would crow. You conceit, exclaimed Wendy indignantly. Of course, I did nothing. Oh, you did a little. A little? If I am no use, I can at least withdraw, she said, jumping back into bed and covering her head in a dignified way with the bedclothes. 
Oh, Wendy, please don't withdraw, Peter exclaimed in great distress. I can't help crowing when I'm pleased with myself. One girl is more used than twenty boys. This was rather clever of Peter, and at these sensible words Wendy got up again. She even offered to give Peter a kiss if he liked. Peter looked puzzled, but seeing the thimble on Wendy's finger, he thought she meant to give him that and held out his hand for it. Now Wendy saw at a glance that the poor boy did not even know what a kiss was, but being a nice little girl of motherly disposition, she did not hurt his feelings by laughing at him, but simply placed the thimble on his finger. Peter admired the thimble very much. Shall I give you a kiss? He asked, and jerking a button of his coat, solemnly presented it to her. Wendy at once fastened it on a chain which she wore round her neck, and forgetting the puzzle in his mind, she once more asked him for a kiss. Immediately he returned the thimble. Oh, I didn't mean a kiss, I meant a thimble. What's that? he asked. It's like this, replied Wendy, and gently kissed his cheek. Oh, cried Peter, how nice! And he began to give her the thimbles in return, and ever afterwards he called a kiss a thimble and a thimble a kiss. But Peter, how old are you? continued Wendy. I don't know, but quite young. I ran away the day I was born. Ran away? Why? Because I heard my father and mother talking about what I was to be when I became a man. I don't want to be a man. I want always to be a little boy and have fun. So I ran away and lived among the fairies. Wendy was almost speechless with delight at the thought of sitting beside a boy who knew fairies, and after a minute said, Peter, do you really know fairies? Yes, but they are nearly all dead now. You see, Wendy, when the first baby laughed for the first time, its laugh broke with a thousand pieces, and they all went skipping about, and that was the beginning of fairies. And now, whenever a new baby is born, its first laugh becomes a fairy. So there ought to be a fairy for every little boy and girl, but there isn't. You see, children know such a lot now. They soon won't believe in fairies, and whenever a child says, I don't believe in fairies, there's a fairy somewhere that falls down in that. Peter suddenly looked about the room as though he were searching for something. Tinkerbell had disappeared. Before he could grow anxious, however, a tinkling of bells was heard, and Peter, who knew the fairy language, of course understood it. He pulled open the door in which his shadow had been hidden, and out sprang Tinkerbell, very angry with him for shutting her up accidentally in the drawer. She skipped about the room, but Wendy gave such a cry of delight that Tink was frightened and hid behind the clock. But Peter, continued Wendy, if you don't live with the fairies, where do you live? I live with the lost boys. Who are they? Why, they are the children who fall out of their perambulators when their nurses are looking the other way. If they are not claimed within seven days, they are sent far away to the never, never, never land to defray expenses. I'm their captain. Oh, what fun! But Peter, why did you come to our nursery window? Peter told her that he came to listen to the lovely stories Wendy's mother related to her children, for the lost boys had no mothers and no one to tell them any stories. He also told her how he led them against their enemies, the pirates and the wolves, and how they enjoyed bathing in the lagoon, where beautiful mermaids sang and swam all day long. I must go back now, he went on. The boys will be anxious to hear the end of the story about the prince and the glass slipper. I told them as much as I knew, and they are longing to hear the rest. Wendy begged him to stay. I'll tell you lots more, she promised, ever so many stories if you'll only stay. Come, Wendy, exclaimed Peter, struck with a new idea. You can tell us all the stories there, and darn our clothes, and tuck us in at night. None of us has ever been tucked in. All the boys long for a mother. 
Oh, Wendy, do come. It was a tempting idea to Wendy, but a sudden thought came across her mind. Peter, I can't. Think of mommy. Besides, I can't fly. I'll teach you, Wendy. This was too much for her. Peter, will you teach John and Michael to fly as well? Yes, if you like. So John and Michael were awakened, and directly they heard that there were pirates in the never, never, never land, they began to clamor to go at once. They watched Peter fly about the room and tried to imitate him, flapping their arms clumsily at first like unflatted birds, and flopping about all over the place. That will never do, Peter said. I must blow the fairy dust on you. Now wiggle your shoulders as I do. So they tried and found that they could fly, just a little at first, from the bed to the floor and back again, then over the bed and across the room, and then, as they grew braver, almost as freely and easily as Peter himself. Tink, lead the way, called Peter, and the fairy shot out like a little star. None of the children had time to put on their day clothes, but John snatched his top hat as he flew out of the window, followed by Michael. A minute afterwards, Mrs. Starling, who had just returned from the party, rushed into the nursery with Nana at her heels, for Nana had been anxious about her charges and had just succeeded in breaking her chain. But it was too late. The children were already on their way to the Never 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 Land. Part 2 The Never 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 Land Far away in the Never 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 Land, the lost boys lived in the depths of the forest, on the banks of a lake now covered with ice. The trees were bare without their summer dress, and wolves prowled and howled in the distance, and wild beasts snarled in the undergrowth, and pirates sailed villainously up the lake, and red Indians, who were friends of the boys, lived secretly in their wigwams hidden in the glades of the woods. The lost boys, who, in their fur coats, looked more like bears than boys, were anxiously awaiting Peter's return. There were six of them, slightly soiled, the eldest, then came Toodles, and Nips, and Curly, and the twins, who were so much alike that one named it for both of them, so each was called twin. They lived like moles under the ground, for fear of the pirates and the wolves. Each one had a special staircase hollowed in a tree trunk so that they could easily run down among the roots of the trees into their home. They were playing about happily, although they were beginning to be a little anxious that Peter was so long away. Slightly was toodling on a whistle and dancing quite merrily with the ostrich for a partner, a queer companion you will say, when suddenly the gruff voices of the pirates were heard. Nibs who was very brave, slipped away through the trees to scout, but the others had only just time to scuttle down the stairs in the hollow trees before the big ugly buccaneers came tramping up, holding their captain, who was sitting in state upon a sledge. You could not imagine a more dreadful-looking villain than that man was. His name was James Hook, and it suited him. He had two most evil-looking black eyes, his face was seamed with lines which seemed to express his wicked thoughts. His hideous chin, all unshaven, was as black as ink and as prickly as a furt bush. His hair was long and black and it hung around his face in greasy curls. He was singing a horrible song about himself, keeping the time by swinging in the air the gruesome stump of his right arm, on which a double iron pronged hook was fixed instead of a hand. Hence his name. That man was the most wicked pirate who ever lived. He simply wallowed in wickedness. Even his own crew dreaded him. So no wonder the lost boys started like rabbits to their cave. Now Captain Hook most of all wanted to find Peter Pan, for it was Peter who a long time before, in an encounter between the pirates and the lost boys, had cut off his right arm and flung it to a passing crocodile. 
The crocodile had liked the taste of it so much that ever since he had wandered from land to land and from sea to sea, licking his lips for the rest of the captain. The captain had naturally some reason for hating Peter, for he had a dreadful time in eluding the pursuit of the voracious crocodile, but still the beast dodged his footsteps and followed him on and on and on by land and sea wherever he went. The captain only got a start when the crocodile was asleep, and with that and a swift sheep, he had managed so far to escape. It was an awful life. Fortunately for Hook, the crocodile had once, in an ill-advised moment, swallowed an alarm clock, one of those patent 99 years clocks, warranted to go anytime, anywhere, and anyhow. Go it did, and it ticked so loudly that the captain could always hear it coming, and it was the signal for him to bolt. Hook sat down on one of the enormous forest mushrooms, in the never, never, never land, mushrooms grow to a gigantic size to deliberate about his mode of revenge. He was in the middle of a torrent of braggings and boastings when he felt his sitting getting not only warm, but much too warm, and a little wonder in that, for when he furiously leapt up, he found that he had really been sitting on a chimney of the underground home, which Peter had cleverly disguised. He realized at once that the Lowe's boys must be living in safety down below. Very soon, he had a wicked, treacherous plan settled. He determined to cook a huge, rich cake with beautiful green icing and a poison inside. He was sure that the Lowe's boys, who had no mother to look after them, would eat it greedily and die with awful pains inside. Smee, as the captain's wily lieutenant was called, was overjoyed at this plan and chuckled loudly. Shake hands on, said Hook, but Smee did not want to, and begged to be excused. Po, Smee, Po, said the captain in an awful voice, so Smee had to take the horrid Hook in his hand, and they both danced round while Hook sang with diabolical grimaces. Yo ho, yo ho, when I say po, by fear they're overtook. Notes left upon your bones when you have shaken hands with Hook. Just as he was gloating over his pleasant scheme, a queer sound was heard, like a corn crake coming nearer and nearer through a barley field. Tick tack, tick tack, tick tack. The crocodile, the crocodile, the pirate captain yelled and in a moment was flying for his life. The pirates had scarcely disappeared in the depths of the forest when the Indians crept silently up in pursuit of them. Tiger Lily, their chieftainess, was at their head, now running swiftly under the trees, now listening with her ear to the ground to know where her enemies had gone. For, like Tinkerbell and Wendy, she loved Peter Pan, and his enemies were her enemies. The Redskins slid along, following the pirates with steps as quiet as those of a beetle crawling through the grass. They soon passed far out of sight, and then, one by one, the lost boys peeped from their tree trunks, and seeing that all was quiet, came out again to their playground in the woods. But their safety did not last for long. A fierce barking of wolves was heard, and Nibs, who had gone off by himself, rushed, quite out of breath, into the midst of the boys, closely pursued by a pack of lean and hungry wolves with glittering fiery eyes. What were the lost boys to do in this terrible plight when their leader was far away? Fortunately, one of them remembered Peter's plan. Whenever he was attacked by wild beasts, Peter used to run at them backwards, jumping along the ground, squinting at them through his legs. The Lowe's boys did this all together, and really, it was so astonishing that the wolves fled with terrified howls to the thickest where they lived. Then Nibs told the boys how he had seen the loveliest white bird you could imagine. It was flying this way, he said. 
He looked so wearied, and as it flew, it moaned, "Poor Wendy." Are you sure it was a bird? They asked. Nibs was quite sure, and almost at once they saw Wendy flying through the trees in her white nightgown. Tinker Bell was by her side, darting at her and telling the boys that Peter wanted her shot, for Tinker was rather a bad little fairy sometimes. She said this because she was jealous of Wendy, since Peter and Wendy had kissed each other. Instantly, Toodles seized his bow and arrow and shot at the bird, as he thought, and she fell fainting to the ground. At once, the boy saw that she was no bird, but a little girl, and perhaps the very mother whom Peter had promised to bring them. They were very frightened and soon were sure that they had done a dreadful thing, for Peter came flying down with John and Michael and immediately inquired after Wendy. She flew this way, haven't you seen her? he asked. Yes, said Toodles, and pointed to her as she lay motionless on the ground. Peter bent over her and took the arrow, and in his anger would have killed Toodles with it if Wendy had not stayed him by feebly moving her hand. Then they were all glad, for Wendy was not dead, as they had thought, but only stunned. The arrow had fortunately struck the button which Peter had given her in mistake for a kiss. Soon she was quite well again, but so faint and tired after her long flight through the air. The boys did not know what to do. They did not like to carry her down into the cave, as it might not be sufficiently respectful, so they planned to build a house over her. Only they did not know what kind of house to build. Then Wendy sang in her half-sleep the kind of house she wanted, and the boys fetched the logs out of the forest, and a grate and a rug from the underground cave, and built a beautiful home for her out of wood, and tarpaulin and make-believe. They made a chimney out of John's tall hat, which he had been London enough to bring with him, and they made a splendid knocker out of the sole of one of Toodles' boots. When it was finished, it was built round Wendy as she lay on the ground. Peter knocked solemnly at the door, and Wendy opened it and came out very pleased and happy. The lost boys knelt before her and begged her to be their mother, and tuck them in at night time and tell them stories before they went to bed. She said that she was not quite sure if she could, but she would do her best if only Peter would be father, and that now, if they liked to come in, she would tell them the story of Cinderella. In they bundled, one after the other, to listen to the tale, and they were so big and the house was so small that they must have been packed like sardines inside. But a sort of cozy feeling like that was, I expect, just what they wanted, and they were very happy. The evening fell softly down on the forest, and the shadows rose, so that everything was dark and still, save for the occasional baying of a wolf. Lights were lit in the little house, and at last, when it was quite night, Peter came out with his sword and walked up and down like a sentry to guard the new little mother he had brought for the lost boys. Music